Got it. So, I'm Scott, N7JI, and uh, it was, uh, I, I thought after we taught the last general class, when Mario had said, you know, I really would like to do antenna modeling. Well, as you see, so would a lot of other people, because now we're up to 28, well, 26. Yeah, we've never had a turnout like this. Nope. So, anyway. Um, okay, let's take about 30 seconds each and say who we are and where we are and what we, and what we want out of this. So, I'm Scott, N7JI, and I have become a great, uh, a great fan of antenna modeling. KK7BRP. And remember to unmute yourself, everybody, when it's time. Hi, I'm a uh, name's Nate, but I, I have I like my nickname being Hamster now. I'm a, I got my license and uh, using it remotely. Um, November first is when I got my license, and ever since then I've been really into the radio, and I really enjoy it, and I really want to learn more about it. And so I'm doing this antenna class. Um, I have one brother that's a radio operator, and my dad is too. Um, we're trying to get other ones licensed, but they cannot read yet. And so okay. we're trying to get them to read. Um, but right. I really like my radio license, and I've been using it a lot. And I, one of my favorite things is nets. I don't know why, but I just love nets so much. Very cool. All right, uh, Bob, KT7M. Sorry, K7TM. Get this thing running here. I'm in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. We're at the Spokane DX Association. And I, I do a lot of modeling. I have, I have wire tree, wires in the trees. I'll get the microphone down here. That'll help. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm Bob. I'm in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And we're associated with the Spokane DX Association. We've um, actually had uh, Bob Saval. Uh, W7ZX. He's Varel, yes. We know him quite well because he came from here. Yeah, well, he is, he lives up here and he's part of the Spokane Club, but he's moving to Arizona. He's got a new new job down there, but he's going to keep his property up this way, so that's good. Anyway, um, we're seeing what we can learn and what the difference between this is and and the easy neck. Okay. Uh, KE7FKZ. Dana, KE7FKZ. I live in Springfield, Oregon. Not a very active ham, but I hope to change that. And one of the things that I think would be enjoyable to do is to build some of my own antennas. So this uh, looks like a good place to learn something about that. Uh, Gary, this is Gary, AG78. I don't know very much, but I'm willing to share what I know. I know how to operate, uh, at least pretend to operate Hornet 2. And uh, I, uh, I, I was only licensed as an extra in 2019, so I haven't been doing this for a whole long time. But I, uh, I have built a lot of things, and I love building antennas. And I'm going to show you how to get started with Foronec 2. I'm not going to be able to explain much theory, but uh, I can show you how to get from point A, from, from where you are to where you want to be, probably, AG78. Okay, how about K7PM? K7PM, this is Paul, live in Colton, Oregon. You did a good job on the uh, general class, Scott. My wife dug it and I set in on a little bit of it, so. Cool. Thank you. Uh, long time ham, put up a lot of antennas, usually just put them up, tried to get them to work. So I thought I'd reverse engineer that and do the math with this. Yeah. With a smaller <laughs> lot, <laughs> design something first. So getting old enough, I don't want to climb a lot and redo. <laughs> That's about it. All right. 87QJ. Uh, Hello, I'm Harold, 87QJ, and I'm also with the Spokane DX Association. I'm up in uh, Deer Park, Washington, and I'm just interested in uh, learning about this. Okay, Mario. So I'm a um, uh, physician out in uh, Boise, Idaho. I live in Emmett, um, and I have a, a nephew out in Eugene um, that 
got me linked into you guys. Um, I use my job to be able to afford my toys like ham. And this modeling thing is just absolutely thrilling to me. This is, this is fun. This is really fun. And I appreciate you guys doing this. Okay. Robert, RNA. Mute. Okay, here. Um, Robert, case of an RNA. Um, I live down the hill from Scott, so uh, he hears more things than I do. Um, I've got, a, I think I've got three wire antennas at this point, um, supported by bamboo poles, and I'm into bamboo poles. Um, and Gary, I've pulled out about 40 poles to see if I can get a little bit more height for my, uh, my dipole. Um, anyway, so uh, I'm a new <laughs> ham, actually, about four years ago, maybe, three or four years ago. Um, and that's, that's me. All right, uh, KL7 Whiskey Yankee. Hi, Walter, I live in uh, Anchorage. Um, <clears throat> wires and trees is a, is a fairly good description. I've got uh, probably three, three sets of antennas out there and the, the wires are in the trees and all the wires are broken. Uh, in, the, in the last couple of days, uh, it was gusting, uh, the peak gust was 48 and uh, the, the, the trees aren't straight. They're skinny little spruce trees. So uh, when, when they talk about uh, using a slingshot to th throw stuff over a branch, the area I'm shooting at is about six inches in diameter and the branch is <laughs> thumb sized. Okay, uh, K7MIL. Lance here, I'm in Eugene, Oregon. Been licensed for maybe five years or so. So not very long, mostly into VHF and UHF right now. Would like to get into other stuff later. Uh, but for the time being, I'm keeping myself occupied building antennas and uh, getting satellites now. So I've got a rotator and tracking software and I'm using this Yagi, you kind of see it behind me over my shoulder there. Um, but when I build a folded dipole one and that's what I'm working on right now. And I think Gary could probably help me understand that program a little bit better. Okay. Uh, how about the other Juliet India? That'd be you, Chris. <laughs> hey, this is Chris. I'm from uh, Springfield, Oregon. Um, had a license for just over a year now, just upgraded to my, my general in November and really wanting to get into some HF stuff. So I figured uh, antenna is gonna be the key for me. So I wanna learn about this. This is a great opportunity, I appreciate it. Cool, all right, uh, N7 Romeo Whiskey Bravo. Hey, I'm uh, Craig Cherry and I live in Eugene and I'm really a beginner at this stuff, but uh, I'm interested in understanding modeling better. And you guys have already answered one of my questions. I was pointing around some of the examples and I was trying to figure out why is it showing the field strength at the base of the transmission line instead of where the antenna really is, but I guess that's just how it works. So that helps to understand that I wasn't doing that wrong. Uh, and I'm, I'm mostly probably going to be starting uh, tinkering with some VHF and UHF stuff. Uh, so the modeling should be pretty helpful for that. Yeah, it definitely works for that too. Every, it's the same thing, just scaled. Um, W0KMA. Hi, I'm Jeff. Um, I live in Crow, uh, Oregon, and I've been a ham for not quite a year. Um, I'm uh, currently working on some antenna designs, long wire, and uh, maybe a loop. Um, so I wanted to uh, get some modeling done. All right, W7SLS has no mic. Jeremy, WDM. You're muted. Jeremy from Eugene. Um, got an HF radio two days ago, so uh, I feel like this is timely information to try to start building something out for myself. So just interested in learning some new software and trying to get my feet wet with it. Okay, KK7BIC. Yeah, uh, my name is Dave from uh, Eugene, Oregon, and I've just been a ham for a few months um, in the process right now of putting up a 
Ed Fong, DBJ1, um, got it all set up. Just need to run the coax and then I'll be hopefully up and going with that. I'm hoping to get my general maybe in a month if I can get stick with my studying. Uh, that's it. All right. How about uh, KM6WIU? San Luis Obispo uh, in uh, College Amateur Radio Club uh, at Cal Poly here. And yeah, just looking to learn more about antennas and make my own Yagi hopefully soon. Okay, how about Carol? I know it's KF7 WJK. She might not have a mic. Uh, I know Dave W7CX doesn't have a mic. Larry doesn't have a mic. Uh, K7 PHM. Yeah, good afternoon, guys. Uh, I'm uh, Rick K7 PHM. I've been licensed in 1961. And I probably built more antennas my f uh, novice year than I have the rest of my life. Been spending that working on everybody else's electronics and <laughs> no time to play. So not a not a whole lot of stories and. It's time at uh, 76 that I maybe want to play with some antennas in the backyard. Cool. And that's about it for me. Thanks a lot for doing this. All right, very good. Uh, how about our Canadian ham in the bunch? Hey, Scott? Yep, there we go. I'm the Canadian guy, I guess. Uh, lone rap. I took a course from you uh, last month. Yep. Uh, my first one, then you put me on to a fellow that does testing in Canada and the U.S. both, and I caught up with him, and two weeks later, I wrote my exam and passed with honors. And so, thanks for that, and uh, so I'm pretty new, and uh, I've got basic vertical antenna out there. I'm pretty disappointed already. <laughs> I just got the cable run in a couple of days ago. Lots of listing, but no QSOs yet. It's pretty sad. And so it's just a TP vertical six to one balance. Other than that, lots of repeater action local and stuff. It's pretty popular here in Peterborough, Ontario. Uh, B3 PBO. Uh, people join in from all over the world, upper state New York a lot, even over in Europe. Um, I'm going to get a better, a better uh, VHF, UHF antenna at least so I can reach out some more. But I'm here to learn. And thanks again, Scott and everybody. Excellent. From Canada. All right. Let's see. KK7 Charlie, X Ray Charlie. That's a pretty new call. Yeah, I got my call sign recently. I'm out of Moscow, Idaho. Thinking of building some antennas, so I'd like to know how to model them and stuff. Okay. Do we miss anyone? All right, Gary, it's all yours. Hello, Gary. There we go. You're still muted, Gary. Okay. Okay, now you can hear me, I hope. Yep. And um, so what we're going to do to start out is we're going to build a, build a dipole from scratch. And it may even be useful somehow to somebody. But uh, then after, we're just going to go through the basics of operating the, sy the system. And then we're going to, uh, then we'll go in a little deeper and <laughs> we'll see see where we end up. I'm, I'm real flexible. I don't mind questions at all. So, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to go slow and patiently. And we'll make sure that everybody can keep up. Hey Gary. Yeah. You mind if I uh, if I go outside for about ten minutes and come back? Are no, I don't. Okay. I don't mind. All right. So um, okay. So uh, we're going to start out in. Um, in Windows Explorer. And we're going to create a place to put our files. 
and um, so find a place on your computer and if you already have one that's great we're, um, once you have have your uh, explorer window open we're going to go new text document and it's going to put up a file name and we're going to type in a name and we're going to change the txt on the end to nec so i'm creating a file called test.nec and uh, it says it's not going to be usable but it will be um, go ahead and start up for NEC2 if you don't have it running already. I can't figure it out. Um, so here's, this is Windows Explorer. And just go somewhere on your computer where you want to put the file. Right click with your mouse and choose new text document. You see that hamster? Yeah, I just tried it on um, uh, um, I don't really, I keep on trying. Oh, I click okay. on the file and I can't see what to click on. I think okay. that might be my problem. Um, do you, yeah, so we just want a new file and um, see, is it off the screen for you? Is that the problem? So you want to click on text document. Oh, I problem might be that you're not showing file extensions. Let me show you how to do that. Go to view and file in Windows Explorer. Make sure you have file name extensions turned on. Because I went on to it and could not figure it out. <clears throat> um, uh, Do you see so, a file? Did you, were you um, able to create a file? No. Um, uh, maybe I could share my screen and show you guys. Okay. And you can, you can go to your desktop or documents, documents is a good place. Okay, so file name extensions is up here at the top. It's, uh, it's one of these check boxes here. Do you see file name extensions hamster? Um, so do I click OK on here? Can, are you guys able to see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. Do I click OK now? Um, OK, so you're in the wrong place. First, let's turn on file name extensions. It's one of these check boxes near the top. Is this? No, over on the right. Move over to the right, farther to the right. Oh, wrong way. <laughs> no, go over here. It's it's not it's not in the menu bar. It's down oh. about an inch. There's a checkbox called file name extensions. It's keep going over, keep going over, keep going over. Now go down. See file name extensions. Ah, uh, there. Yeah, turn that on. Now let's just go ahead and go into your documents folder. Document folder. It says documents, this PC. Oh, no, that's down. Yeah. I'm usually on. not on this. Um, uh, I'm usually not on the computer. OK. Now you can create a new folder if you want. If, if you just right click over on the right side. No, no, farther over. To, there you go, right there. No. 
go up, go down a little bit and right click. No, not there. So go down a little bit more. There you go. Now right, right, here? right click in the blank area. Right. Right click in the blank area on the right. This? Um, yeah, up a little and over to the left, just a little in the blank area, not, not the border. It's not on the border. Yeah. Okay. Where your mouse is. I'm clicking uh, it. I'm clicking right. So I don't see, I don't see your mouse cursor right now. I have two mouse sections. Yeah. Both of mine are not working. Your mice aren't working. Nope, I think they ran away. Uh, anyway, um, hmm. maybe it just won't work. Well, let's create a file anyway. So move down. So you see this over on the left, it says Animatica. You see that folder? You see that folder on the left called Animatica? Yeah, move over to the right. Yeah, right, right where you go, go just a little to the left now. Right there, right click with your mouse. And choose new, 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 and then choose text document. Text document, keep going down, going down, there you go. And let's name it test dot NEC. T-E-S-T -E dot N-E-C. Yeah, there you go. N-E-C? N-E-C, yeah. There you go. Now hit enter. Say okay, yeah. All right. Now yeah. let's start up your, start up your. Uh, yeah, I. For neck two. There you go. How do I stop sharing? Uh, it's up at the top. You should have some options up there to stop sharing. Um, I I'm I usually do not use computers, so it's really hard. I don't know how to open this up to full. Sorry, just can't figure out how to do this. Um, well, you could close this window or you could minimize it. Let's, let's just minimize this. Okay. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and share mine again now. And uh, here we go. Okay, we have a file. That file doesn't have anything in it. We just created it. Okay, I got it. I just exited out. Okay, we're gonna go into Fornec2 and choose file, open Fornec2 file. And um, Open up our NEC file we just created. <laughs> oh, it's, it's confused because it has the same name. So I'm going to go back and open a different file and then I'll go back to that. Uh, hey, Gary, would you yeah. like us to be following along as you do these things? We do it okay. too, or how would you like to do this? Wow, look at this. It's confused. This file was opened recently, so I'm going to have to rename the original file. Hang on. I'm just trying to get mine working right here. So let me go back here. OK. Maybe it'll have better luck now. OK. Oh, wow, that's weird. So, let's try.
try this. Why don't you just rename the okay. new file to something other than just test? Well, when I when I go into edit, it realizes it's the wrong file. So we're fine now. So we're gonna okay, go into settings up here and choose NEC editor new. You see that? Make sure that's turned on. Then go ahead and open your file if you haven't already and then click on this icon and that'll bring up the editor. If you don't do that settings first, you'll you'll get the old editor, <laughs> which you don't want. Okay, we're gonna um, <clears throat> we're gonna create a twenty meter dipole. Real simply, we're gonna add a wire here. So we go to the geometry tab and um, just now I need to remember what. type in here. Okay, so it's a wire. We're going to give it a tag of one. We're going to give it 101 segments. Um, we're going to enter five, or actually minus five, for x1 coordinate. Y1 is going to be zero. Z1 is going to be uh, five. Oh, we'll go, I'm sorry, we'll go 10 on that. X2 is going to be five. Y2 is zero. I'm just hitting the tab key after each one. And then Z2 is also going to be 10. What this is is 10 meters above ground. Now we have to give the, the wire a radius. And the reason is that uh, for neck two, well, NEC in general uses the surface of the wire, not, it, it doesn't treat wires as lines, it treats them as surfaces. And in order for it to have a surface, it has to have a radius. We're gonna enter Pound sign 12 in this case, and that'll be 12 gauge. That's just something that's built into four neck two. It's a shortcut that's built into four neck two. So you don't have to figure out the metric radius of a 12 gauge wire. Okay, so this, we have a wire now. And, um, We're, we're going to add a load or a source. And it's going to be. Sorry, what'd you click on here? To get uh, I clicked on the source load tab. Okay, yeah, sorry. And uh, voltage source number one. You can feed all kinds of stuff in. We're gonna hey, Gary, uh, yeah? could you maximize the window you're typing? It's a little hard to see that. I only have one display, so I've got my thing and your thing both on here. Maximize. The, your editor window. Uh, don't know if there's a way to zoom Maybe, in maybe, it, maybe that's, all, that's probably all it does, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> never mind. All right. Gary, I I'm, I'm apologize, but uh, how did, where did you, get that one your cursor's in right now. How did you bring that up? This guy, four yeah. to edit. Okay, so you want to go to settings. Okay. In the main window. Right. Choose NEC editor new. Right. Then you go to, you can, you can go right here. Okay. And to the input. Oh, okay. That'll, Got that'll, it. That'll Got bring it, it up. Okay. We'll go back to geometry and make sure you have everything entered here. I have a question about that. So I typed all the stuff in and then I click someplace. And it seems like it just went away. Do I have to do something to make it save it? Um, just click on line two and that'll 
Uh, well, I have a line two and I don't have a line one anymore somehow. Yeah, if you, well, see, if you just click on two and scroll up. Oh. It, yeah. You know, it gets it's, a free, it's a free interface. It, it doesn't, it, it, it rarely crashes, but occasionally you'll see something like that. Huh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it gets lost sometimes. Not too bad. So tag one, segs 101, X one, and that's the first X coordinate. It's going to be minus five meters. It's going to be on the Y axis, so zero. It's going to be 10 meters above ground. X2 is going to be five meters, quarter of a wave length. And Y2 is zero, Z2 is 10. Huh? Yeah, speaker on here. And radius is pound sign 12, 12 gauge. Also, Gary, did you, yeah? do you what are we in the meters or feet? We're going to be only working in meters today. Ooh, tricky. The reason is that things like this uh, pound sign 12 won't work if you're in feet. Ah, OK. <laughs> it scales. Yeah, so it should scale, say scaling equals meters. And you select that from the symbols tab, right? Uh, let's see. Now, if you go, I think down it's, next, go down I think, next to geometry, I think symbols. It's in the settings here. Let's see, mm, length yeah, unit meters. I think, oh, okay, good. Right here. You can also divide, design in wavelengths. In other words, it'll use it'll figure out the wavelength mm -hmm. for the frequency you're designing, or you can use feet or inches, but. Natively, it's in meters. Everything's in meters. And it, it, it can get confusing sometimes if you don't leave it that way. So the source load, we want a voltage source. Our tag is going to be 1. Segment is going to be 51. Uh, reel is going to be 1. correctly. Magnitude one. Hmm. Ah, okay. No, yeah. Yeah, this is right. So yeah, no imaginary. Right. So that's good. If you click down below that, it'll make sure that's all saved. Hmm. Um, so yeah, mine mine doesn't work the same way. What uh, version of software are you running, by the way? Okay, I I'm running. Um, whoops, I think I just killed it. Yep, I just killed it. So I have five point nine zero. I have five point nine point three, and some of this is is just not acting quite the same. Well, mine is. Uh, 5.9.3. I just downloaded oh, it today. Okay. All right. Well, very and interesting. Apparently, it didn't save my window positions. That's fine. So I got to reopen that. What? Uh, he had it a minute ago. Back to where it is. Uh, here it is. It's back in the old file again. Okay. So I'm going to enter all this stuff again because I didn't save my file. <laughs> one, 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 minus five, zero, ten, five. Zero, ten, radius, pound sign, twelve. Okay, now load tag one. That means it's going to get attached to that wire. S segment fifty-one. Reel is one, 
and the rest is fine. And I'm going to save this right now. Now, if it blows up again, I or if I close it. Okay, we're going to yeah. You're making a difference on that that uh, the column where it says parentheses OPT. If it's uh, mine, won't be mine. Doesn't go blank. It's either zero zero or zero. It has a drop down menu. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It, okay, zero is the default, so you know it's fine. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to the frequency and ground tab now. Curry, um, how do you decide how many segments to divide a wire into? We'll get there. Okay. Basically, uh, if the pro program can handle it, then you use the number of segments that works well for your geometry. And there are there's trade-offs here and there, and I'll explain that some of that in a while. Okay, well, let's go ahead and enter um, 14.1 for megahertz. And instead of doing this out in outer space, we're going to put it on real ground. <clears throat> this option here isn't important in this case. Um, so I won't get into that right now. Ground type, we're going to use um, average because everybody's average. There's no special people here. We're all average. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and save this. I'm just pressing Control S. Now I'm going to click on this calculator icon over here. You can, if you want to save it, you can click on this. They put that there to remind you to save your work because who knows what's going to happen. We're going to do a frequency sweep first. We're going to change resolution to one degree because it'll be a little more accurate that way. And our computers are fast enough, I think. For a frequency start, we're going to enter 13. For stop, we're going to enter 15.35. What we're doing is we're going one megahertz below and one megahertz above the 20 megahertz, the 20 meter band. And for step, we're going to do 0.1. And then we click on generate. Oops. Okay, so I did something wrong here. Um, Rather than, I, I could show you the, the troubleshooting part of this right now, but I'm not going to. I'm going to look at my geometry and see what I did wrong. I, probably the source load is, hmm. Well, I'm going to delete this row. I think it thinks that this is, yeah, it thought that was a real row and it wasn't. Okay, I'm gonna save it, try again. Okay, this time it liked it. Okay, we have an antenna. And um, so I'm gonna go through the interface and show you what we're looking at. Here's, here's our frequency at the bottom here, this blue line underneath the blue line, there's a frequency readout. This is like doing a trace on an antenna analyzer. This is showing us our SWR. Our antenna is a little bit short. So our, our frequency is higher uh, than we want it. Excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. Excuse me. Uh, when I said generate, it said uh, something about file not found. Okay. Go ahead and choose open again. Make open. sure you have that file open. Open for any C in out file? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Sorry, it might, it's open. Yeah, it could be in your menu here if you had it open recently. Oh. Yeah. 
Okay. Now, how do I know whether it's uh anyway. I guess I've got a picture of a the geometry. Uh how do you get the waves that you've got up the blue red? Okay, this uh, is wave. if you press F five that'll pop up. But it'll also View. View. Um uh, I, I've got a so you box up prob probably Z. it's got prob a picture of a Z X and Y axis with a ground right. plane and uh, it says 14.1 megahertz right axis 0.2 meters uh, theta and phi. Uh, okay, well let's go look at your file again. We'll go ahead and edit that file. Make sure all your wire your wire looks like this. All right. So everybody needs to make sure their files look like. So the input file, edit input file. Yeah. Input dot nec file. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So okay. I've got uh, yeah, exactly the same as you had. I got no blank columns or rows. Great. Source load. Source, same thing. One fifty one oh one oh one. Yeah. Voltage SRC. And okay. then I go frequency ground, 14.1 real ground average. I guess that's it. And then yeah. you, I think from there. Yeah, so just click on save. Uh, on the calculator or click save on save. First. Yeah, save, save just. And Control then click. Left. Okay, no. Yeah, then click on okay. the calculator. Click on frequency yeah. sweep. Yep. Set your frequency at 30. Oh, set, change your resolution to 1. 1. Point. Okay, just one, yep. And start 13, stop 15.35, yep. step step point one, yep. click on generate. Yep. And it says uh, error, ren file, file not found, source equals new text dot out, uh, program, I don't know. <clears throat> Why it says I get an error code. Yet it seems to have generated the, the model, but why I'm getting an error code. Oh, well, um, so you don't see anything different. It's just you're getting what that you? error. What ver what version yeah. are you running? If you go to the uh, main. 593. Okay, great. Um, you want to share your screen? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll stop mine. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. I just want to make I sure I'm on the right page. I don't think anybody minds going over this again, so right. we're going to go over it till people are comfortable with it. All right, share screen. Got to get the right one here. Wind link, no. Geometry, no. Uh, you want the screen, not the window. Yeah, you can share the whole screen. So it's, it's it's usually the first choice. Yeah, I've got a different screen, so share. I think that's the one we want. Oh, okay. That's interesting. So your yeah. source and your desk end should probably be the same. Current or oh, okay. I, I'll tell you what the problem is. Okay, good. I think <laughs> I think you're operating in the Fournet two folder on your C drive in program files, and normally you can't write to a file there. Right. You have to put so that. I need to put my destination, uh, my executable file, right on the desktop. Or no, not the executable. The the uh, the antenna definition oh. file needs to be on your can be on your desktop or in documents. You mean the text file that I created? Yeah. So that oh. needs that can't be in the. It needs to move from here to my desktop. Yeah, desktop's good. Desktop will work. Just don't put I'll just it in. Drag it onto the desktop. Oh, it's in your desktop. No, I just dragged it from uh, amateur radio folder I have on my computer to the desktop. Okay. okay. Well, that shouldn't make a difference. Should work but now. We'll we'll try it. Okay. Go ahead and so run it. It should. Yeah. Go ahead and run it. We'll see what happens. Run it. If you if you can share your whole screen, then we can then we can see everything that's happening. Because all we're seeing right now so is open it first from there. 
We're just seeing a window oh, right now. We're not right. seeing the screen. Yeah. Let me try that again then. I don't know how to share the one that shows. Okay. Usually it'll be the know. first. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can you see there everything now? Yeah, there we go. Nice well, I background. I just dragged it out of that and dropped it on my desktop. Right okay, so let's rename that file with, an, with no spaces in it. Um, we don't we don't want any, any spaces in that file name because any right. any I'm, C NEC is an old NEC is an old crusty program and uh, poor neck two yeah. can't pass it well. Doesn't All make right. spaces. Okay. Go ahead and open that up now. Just double click it? No. Or well, open it up through the program. Go to edit. Yeah, go to file open. Okay. No, not there. Input. Not there. Go to file open. There you go. Yeah, choose that. I think the problem was that it had a, a space in the file name. It wasn't where it was located. Yeah, it is. Click on test one. Okay, now go. Let's go ahead and go to edit. Input file. Yep. Looks okay. Good. Yeah, go ahead and click on the calculator. Frequency sweep. Uh, that looks good. Generate. Oh, that's better. Okay. Now in. So now it so sucks. So you want a window? Uh, go to your main window. Uh, okay. And go to. Is it show? I think it's under window. Window main geometry panel. Oh, geometry, main, 3D viewer. No, not that. You want F5, mine chart. So apparently it's open. F we just need to uncover it. So move move this main window out of the way. It's it's back behind your editor or something. Not you that. Maybe. Yeah, just get that out of the way. Uh, maybe it's behind that window. I don't know. Is it on your other screen? If you push oh, F5, uh, Gary, did you say F5 is the right F, thing? F5. Will. I wonder if that would bring it to the front. F5. Oh, my goodness. Wow. This thing. So, so we need to run it. Go ahead and click on that calculator icon again. Over here. That one will work. Yeah. Frequency sweep. Generate. Yep. It disappeared again, wherever it, it was. Hmm. Let's go ahead and close. Close. Click on the close gadget on the, the close. Yeah, just close the main window and we'll start it up oh. again. Close the main window. Exit? Yeah. Do you want to exit for an EC2? Yeah. Right. And go ahead. Oh, file already exists. What's that all about? Just popped up. Just close that. Okay, go, right, ahead. I'm out of it. go ahead and start it up again. Oh, did you still have a window open? I got uh, my. What do you mean a window? Yeah. Okay, close this again. Oh, oh I haven't got any more. I got the what, zoom. What, win. what is that? What? Just go ahead and cancel that. Open what what is that window? That's WinLink. Oh, never mind. Okay, don't worry about that. Yeah, just so cancel that open file, right? Uh, yeah, close this. Close this open file. Yeah, this this is probably the problem right here. Close this window that says open file. Click cancel. Click cancel on that. Well, what that was doing was it was keeping the program running in the yeah. background. Really? 
Yeah. So that folder. Okay. So try Not enough. Uh, low. low yeah, go, memory. Go ahead okay. and start. Go ahead and start it up again. Oh, okay. Double click it. Yeah. All right. There it is. That's a beautiful tower. I'll tell you. <laughs> open failure. That's oh, fine. Yeah. That's fine. Just go to right. open. You oh, might. Cool. You might see the pile in your menu. Yeah, go oh, where? Oh, my desktop somewhere, isn't it? Test one. Yeah, that's it. And you see. Oh, okay, I'm let's go ahead and click on that uh, calculator again. Oh, geez, I can't move this because I got the share screen thing in my way. What do you want me to click on? Sorry. Click on the calculator button. Oh, okay. Calculator. It is fun to turn the antenna around, isn't it? <laughs> click on freak. Stop freak. where my mouse. Freak. Click on. Okay. Click on frequency suite. So. No. Nope. Uh, there you go. And change, change that change to, stuff. yeah, change that to one. This is good. Point. 13. No. Start at 13. And stop at 15.35. This is really good exercise for everybody because you can see all the things that can go wrong. Point one, yeah, whoops, and generate. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead and press F5. Yeah, so something's preventing this from I, calculating. I don't think it ran, try it again. No, don't do that. <laughs> Go, go over to Calculate on the main screen. And no. NEC output data. All right. And generate. generate. That time it ran, it looked like. Yeah, but where is it all? Okay. Hey, um, did you did it alarm at all? Did you get a an error message or anything? Let's go ahead and look at that file again. Edit. Go ahead and click on Edit Input. Yeah, there. Just go ahead and show me frequency ground. Make sure that's good. That looks good. Okay. It doesn't matter in this case. Okay, so geometry. Yeah, it all looks good. Okay, just click on that calculator again in the upper right. Okay. Yeah, that all looks good. Seems like it's doing okay, but there's no results. Um, well, you have a file and the file is correct. So maybe you can, um, I don't know if you wanna uninstall and reinstall, but some, something is, Does it make a log file as it tries to run or anything? That would be good to understand if it does. Yeah, I think it's going to be, we're going to be in the weeds pretty quick if we go there. Um, so Darren? 
Hey, Darren. Go to go to calculate yeah. again. Uh, uh, go ahead and close that file. Yeah. I don't think, unless there's nothing in it, which I don't think that's true. If no, you click on geometry, cool. you should see the file. You should see the, the, the data. Yeah, it's all there. It's all there. Okay, so close that window. Save it. I don't know what changed, but. Okay, now go, go to calculate. And start uh, click on NEC output data, but this time click on far field pattern. Okay, and generate it. Let's see what it does. I just want to see if it. Yeah, it's still there. no result. No result. There should be, there yeah, should be should, numbers in all these should, boxes. It should have popped something up. Uh, here, here's a here's a guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, when it runs, I think it it saves a temporary output file and a output folder under the for NEC two. I wonder if it's not able to do that because it's installed in program files. Like I installed mine just oh. off in the root directory. Maybe it can't make its yeah. output yeah. folder in there. That's maybe that's, you just need to move it somewhere else. Yeah. So let's uninstall. Darren, go go ahead and uninstall. I think you can just Fortnite move it. Too. Does it does it even no, have a no, real installer? No, I think it does, and it has. Uh, okay. And we want to install it in C colon for net two. So let's go ahead and uninstall this program. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah, uninstall for net two. Yeah, it's having trouble because it's in the wrong place. Like I, just for reference, I install mine oh, yeah, in, a, in a C slash apps slash for neck two and that that's working okay for me yeah so you can put it in a different non-default folder <clears throat> but maybe no, maybe you can't put it in program files I, it could just be that there's a space in the path and that's the problem yeah that too so uh add or remove yeah and go ahead and There it is, right on at the bottom of the window on the right there. Go ahead and uninstall that. Whoops. What happened? What happened? Slowly. I don't know. What happened to it? Scroll down. I don't know. I'm trying. It won't let me. Hmm. Oh, now it found 150 apps. Okay, so go ahead and there it is. Yeah, let's uninstall that. Wow, that's weird. It's running. <laughs> okay. That was weird. I saw it running there. Mm -hmm. So just, I just wait. Just wait. Just wait. Let's wait till it's done uninstalling. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and click. Are you sure? Yes, we're sure. Looks like you have something tying up your machine there. Okay, go ahead and install it again, wherever you downloaded yeah, from, it. I think from your email. Does that sound appropriate? Yeah. Hey, hey Darren, are, are we going to detonate your computer yet? <laughs> getting close, getting close. <laughs> so I get it from your email. I'll um, download it and install it again while you're yeah. I guess. Okay. Yeah, just um, download the zip file. And, oh, into, and run the installer from that. Into my root directory? I wouldn't do it in the root directory. Yeah, yeah download your well, zip. Somebody's going to tell me where to put so it I'll, this time, right? Let, let me share. I'm going to share and show you how to do this. OK. So you go you go here. Hold on. You're not. It's not up yet. Oh, OK. Oh, Larry says my uh, zip file. Yeah, it's still on my desktop. So should I get rid of it or not? It's a yeah. zip file. Is yeah, it just well, reload it? Is it a zip yeah. file? Then just yeah. open it up from there. Yeah, and run it again. And you know, wait, wait, wait. Uh, might... I'm, I might say, is there an option if you do a right click? Is there a chance to run it as administrator? Because sometimes, 
these kind of things can happen if you don't have administrative privileges yeah. when you do the install. Yeah, but it needs to be in a non-protected folder anyway, so yeah, <laughs> shouldn't it shouldn't be an issue for this case, I think. Okay, no, I just wanted to make sure it wasn't a shortcut to my desktop. That's where it actually is. So is that where I want it? The, yeah. You you can open the installer on your desktop. That's good. Um, Darren, right. did you no. know? Did you know you have two yeah. two uh, two zooms running here? Yeah, yeah. I got one on because I don't have a camera okay. on my um, desktop. I see. <coughs> so anyway. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, go ahead and install that again. But this time, don't put it in program files. Put it in the C drive at the root. Put it at the root. Yeah, put it in C colon backslash four neck two. That's funny. That's what I ended up having to do with WinLink too today. It's probably because of. of um, I'll blame COVID. Because there's a space, there's a space in the file name for program files. I blame that, COVID. I blame COVID. What that does I blame is, it on something. It isn't Pornac two that's the problem. It's it's a problem that that it relies on called NEC. NEC is from the '70s, written in Fortran, and it it doesn't like files with spaces in their name. Okay, I'm gonna while Darren's doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and talk you through this interface here. I think you'll yeah, be fine. I think you, yeah, I think you'll be fine, Darren. Once you get that, I'm gonna have to catch back up with you and get all the input data again. Oh no, the file's Sorry. still there. Test one. Oh right, okay. So you just open that up and run it, and it should be fine. Okay, I'm gonna. Do you want me to share quickly so everybody can see or no? Nah, I think you're all set. Okay, so I gotta click on Edit Input NEC, right? Or the yeah. file open. Just file you, open. File open. You might even see the file in the menu there. Oh I don't yeah, know. right. Probably would have. Probably not. I just, because. Because. Um, because it, you just reinstalled. Well, the text file is still on my desktop. Yeah. So no. Yes. Yeah, go ahead and open it. Okay, I've opened it. I've, uh, I've opened it now. Calculate? No, I can't remember what to do next. Yeah, click on the calculator. Yep. I'll go through the process here again. Frequency sweep. Frequency sweep. 13 yep. to 15.35. Right. Resolution's one, right? Yep. 13.1 uh, for 13. Start. 13. 13.0? It 13. doesn't really matter so much. You don't need the point zero. It's fine. Thirteen. Okay, yeah. Start and then fifteen dot three five stop. All right. And step minus thirty five. Step is point one. Did you say it has to be minus fifteen? No, positive. Oh, okay. Okay. What these are is okay. free. These are frequencies for our scan. Oh yeah. Step. Dot one, and then click generate. Oh, I just got dot one. Generate. And you'll get something that looks like this. Yeah, I got a, a text screen. I got a, I got a like a command prompt type thing going on. Now. That's normal. Okay, so what? Now I, now I look like everybody else's screen. Well, okay. Darren, one one of the things that seems to be happening is your computer is slow, or you have a lot of other things running at the same time. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, it's kind of old. It needs to be wiped clean a little bit. It's working. Right. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna up to speed. Great. I'm gonna describe Thank you, everybody. I'm gonna describe what we're looking at here. This uh, chest dot out file name is actually the name of the file that NEC returned to Fornec2 after it processed the input. And that file name is generated automatically by Fornec2. So this is saying, in order to feed this antenna um, properly, we'd have to feed it at 64.9 uh, ohms impedance. Well, we don't like that. That's no good. 
So we're going to try to fix that in a minute. Um, the frequency is 14.1. It calculates the wavelength for us based on the speed of light, of course. But we're going to look at this impedance chart now. So that's the one with the blue and the red lines in it. And what we're seeing is, um, well, what I see, <laughs> I see that right here at 14.6, it's about one and a half ohms. I, I mean, it's about 1.5 SWR. This reflection coefficient gives us a little more information. There's another box we can click up here called gain slash front back. Well, that's not very helpful at this point. And then there's another box called impedance. And this shows real and imaginary. So here, this bottom chart, for instance, shows phase. SWR is most important to us at this beginning stage. But what it, so this chart says that right now we're resonating at 14.6 megahertz. And I want us to be down here at 14.1. So this is telling me that our intent is a little bit too short. And um, here we have our pattern. Um, we'll get into the vertical mode in just a second. This is a picture of our antenna with the feed point. And there's various things we can do here. Um, we can, for instance, show wire number. Here's our wire, it's number one. We can show segments. That shows all the segments. We gave it 101 segments. And um, we can show load. We'd have to zoom in for that. On this window, we zoom in using page up. <laughs> anyway, so, so that, that's kind of interesting. Some segments can be helpful. Wire numbers, if you got a complicated antenna, wire numbers will help. It'll help. Mostly it'll help you figure out if you modeled it correctly. So there's our dipole. Let's go to uh, currents, turn on current magnitude. And this is, our, this is what we're used to seeing with a dipole, seeing a current highest in the middle. That implies that the voltage is lowest in the middle. We can also show the phase. In this case, it's just one wire, really. So the phase isn't important. Um, if you have mul multiple wires, you can check the phase in relationship to other wires, and that's useful. Okay. All right, Gary. Courtney. Yeah. So for me and the, anybody else that doesn't know for sure, is that a so that's a mid feed then, right? That's what that circle represents, or not? Yeah, that's where the load is. That's where the load. Yeah. That's where the source is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. And um, so if we look at it here, I'm gonna show segments. So this is the middle of the middle segment is where, where the source is. The way sources are applied in Fornet 2 is by replacing a segment, one of the segments becomes um, actually a source instead. Um, so that, that is actually no longer part of the wire right there. This segment right here is not part of the wire anymore. It's instead it's a source. This model we created is the simplest possible model for a dipole. In fact, we can make it an off-center fed dipole pretty easily. We edit the input file, go to source load, change this uh, 
segment for the source to 26. And we'll go ahead and generate that. We're now feeding at the quarter wave point, quarter, quarter of the way along. Our magnitude is the same. Um, the uh, SWR changed for sure. Um, if we want to see other effects, we can change. I'm going to change this to one megahertz and change this to 30. And instead of 0.1, we'll go to 0.5. Otherwise, it's just going to, be, going to take too long. Worst of all. So here you can see um, between 1 and 30 megahertz, we have a couple of dips. Um, we're, remember, we're feeding it at a quarter quarter way quarter of the way along the antenna now. And so this is an off-center fed dipole. And we're getting these two resonance points. Um, <laughs> the SWR goes up to <laughs> 10 million. <laughs> but uh, here, here it's, it's around three or four maybe. If we generate that again, and we put it back the way it was, we will um, be able to zoom in better. Okay, so we're gonna, um, let's see if we can bring the resonant point down to 14.1. So I'm gonna go into the editor. I'm gonna change the segment back to 51, so it's in the middle. And did, everybody, gonna, did everybody get why segment 51 was the middle? Yeah, so segments are numbered starting at one, whereas uh, ver ver vertices are numbered starting at zero. And since we segmented our antenna into 100, 101 pieces, right? Right, and that 51st segment is actually removed. So now we have 50 on one side and 50 on the other. It's be yeah. So, um, our problem here is that the antenna is a little bit too short. That's what it looked like. But we don't wanna just go in here and start changing numbers. So instead, we're gonna go over to symbols here. We're gonna enter a symbol called, um, well, we're gonna enter one called frequency and we're gonna, and we're gonna make it equal to 14.1, we're going to enter another symbol called wavelength. And this is can gonna be, yeah? Sorry, can you bear with us for a second? Sure. I don't know if I'm the only one that's having a problem but jumping around, but what uh, screen did you get the symbols again for? You gotta go open your input file again? Yeah. So we're gonna write this again, are we? Rewrite it, calculate it. Okay. We're we're, oh, we're yeah. gonna we're gonna modify over and over and over. Yeah, yeah, gonna, yeah, I see. Of course, gonna, that's the process. I understand. I just can't remember how to open my darn file again. Which I want settings, uh, main no, menu. File open. File open yeah, NEC. Uh, but it's, it's probably it, it's probably here in your menu. It is. Right. Okay. I'm sorry. And. Uh, where is it? So you go to edit, input file. Oh yeah, edit input. Yeah, and then you went to symbols and then you went to symbols and equations. And now, see, cause I'm flipping back and forth and I can't, okay. I'm, I think I'm, I think we're, I am least with you on okay. symbols and equations, right? Right. Okay. And I've entered frequency equals 14.1. Wavelength equals, I'm, gonna, I'm kind of crazy, so I'm going to enter 792.458 divided by frequency. 
you don't have to be crazy like I am. I'm even going to enter something else here. Okay. I'm going to enter something called velocity factor equals 0 0.98. Okay, so I have three variables here. I have frequency 14.1, velocity factor 0.98, I have wavelength equals 299. You can use 300 if you want. <laughs> I'm just crazy. Does everybody understand that relationship between the speed of light in meters and actually in millions of meters? Per second. Right. So we're now we have the wavelength. Well, wavelength is interesting because we want to modify our geometry. So it's minus wavelength. Hey, Gary, can I interject real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so for everybody, everyone who's watching this, this software is actually somewhat somewhat unique in modeling software because what, what we're basically allowed to do is enter parametric values so that once they're variables, then we can run something called an optimization with, okay. by selecting those variables. So as opposed to just having it hard-coded that these are the dimensions of an antenna element, or an antenna segment, you can basically just go into the frequency, into that symbols table and change your, you know, change your frequency that you're operating on. And that will prop, if you've, if you've done all your math right, that'll propagate all the way through everything. Just so by changing one thing. Our X1 used to be five. Now it's minus wavelength divided by four. And our x2 is now wavelength divided by 4. And actually, this, the software is really quite powerful the further you go, because what you end up being able to do is optimize based on, let's say you have a, let's say you have a six element Yagi, and they're spaced, and you have five individual spaces between those six elements, right? You can lay it out such that, okay, here's my, well, we'll call it reflector, and then the next one is the driven element, and then director one, director two, director three, director four. And then you have inter-element spacing, so you'll have gap one, gap two, gap three, gap four, and gap five. And you can basically model your pieces of wire such that those are then spaced in different locations. And then the optimization tool you can basically select any or all of those variables to say, find me the best gain. Find me the best SWR. Find me something that gives me 50% best gain and 50% best SWR. So it's, it's really, really cool in that regard. Yeah. So Scott, we're going to show them first and then explain. Yep. Um, Gary, one one just annoying question here. Um, I every it's not stopping my generation of of uh, data, but I keep getting this one error that says step radius correction not allowed for structure loading. I, I'm I don't know how to get rid of that. Okay, that would probably be over here in source load. Um, just make sure it looks like this. Source load one. 51, 0, 0, 1, image 1, magnitude 1, phase 0, nom 0. Oh, that didn't have a 0 in it. And I'm going to show you about loads in here in just a minute. I'll go ahead and show you now. Um, we want... Like I'm actually doing, Gary, yeah. like on, on the antenna I'm actually doing right now. Right. I have I have uh, PVC wire, right? mm -hmm. which PVC. is a load. And it actually, you're right, it actually shortened my antenna by about eight feet. Right. 
So I'm going to, in the loads here, I'm adding, for number one, I'm adding wire conductor. And I'm adding, um, you can leave these empty, I think, and then change this to copper. And then we're going to add another one here called wire coat. We're looking at sources. You're looking at loads down at the bottom. Oh, at the bottom. I, gotta... oh, I, had, I had to click on show loads up here. Oh, did you? See where my pointer is? Uh, show loads. I don't even have a screen like yours. Uh, I've only got... I don't have loads. Yeah, you have to click on this checkbox right here where my arrow is. Oh, God, the screen's too small. I'm trying to watch you on my phone and do it on my desktop. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, I, I made my screen, I made my pixels big because I wanted to make sure if people with old computers could, with funky monitors, could still read it. <laughs> but I can make this different. <laughs> anyway, Sorry. so... um. I'm going to set my wire coat now to um, PVC soft. And this needs to be number 12. I, I should put the create a, um, a symbol for this. Number 12 plus point. Zero, zero, 001. What I'm doing is I'm adding a millimeter of soft vinyl insulation. I'll go over here. Well, oh, is that the actual parameter? Plus 12, uh, pound 12, point zero, zero, 0001 that it uses? Why? Just a minute. I'll show you how this works. Wire radius equals, equals 12 gauge. That's what that means. And now I'm going to say wire coat e equals wire radius plus 0 0.001. That's the correct way to do it. And so now I'm going to go back to, to my load here and change this radius to wire coat. And um, because, okay, and there's, there's actually two, there's wire conductor, copper, wire coat, PVC soft, and the, the radius is wire coat, which is defined over here, wire radius plus 0 0.001. This 0 0.001 is one millimeters because everything's in meters. So I'll I'll wait until everybody's caught up. I missed your second line on your load. Your second okay. line entry, your second data entry. So the type is wire coat. Okay, does it matter if it says wire coat and then wire conductor? How'd you move that down to make wire conductor? E, they could, that could be either order, it doesn't matter. Yeah, but how did you do that? Well, I created wire conductor first. I don't think you did. Yeah, I did. And then it scrolled out of the way so you couldn't see it. <laughs> oh, okay. That's, that's one really weird little thing that any that this program does. One, yeah. Line one often disappears. Wire conductor, copper, and uh, uh, that's it. And then back to your notes under symbols, I guess it is, eh? Do we have to save this first before we go back to symbols or anything? Uh, no. Symbols. So I only got two symbols so far. So one disappeared. So here's one is frequency equals 14.1. What happens if one disappeared? How do I scroll up? Scroll up. Just, just click on just the line and scroll up. Arrow. up. Arrow. Just hit the up arrow. arrow. Up arrow scroll up didn't work. Did you try um, hitting the up arrow? Yes, it, it worked. So I've got frequency equals 14 one. 
velocity, I haven't got velocity factor in yet. I got wavelength in. Okay, sorry. I'm you just can... thinking of factor. So what's a velocity factor? Well, that's how we're going to modify the length of the antenna. We'll get oh. to that. Or are you saying what is velocity factor? Oh, the ratio. Okay. And actually, I need to plug it in here. And velocity factor is the speed is the speed at which um, electromagnetic energy travels through a given medium based on what the medium is. So in free space, uh, velocity factor would be one. In coaxial yeah. cable, because it's a dielectric, right. it could be like 0.65. Yeah, and I I corrected my wavelength equals to include the velocity factor. Oh, that's good. Times 299.7924 over frequency velocity factor 98. That was 0.98, right? Yeah. 98%. For oh, wire radius, can't imagine anybody's way all done. Maybe there are uh, equals number twelve. Everything's in meters except number twelve is AWG. Right. <laughs> you, if you want to look up the radius of twelve gauge wire, you're free to do yeah. that. <laughs> like cross sectional area. No, so, okay. so it's so, not a, it's actually defining the surface area of the wire yeah so gary in the geometry tabs we, under radius should we change that to wire radius now yes oh. wire radius and by the way i'm using long long names for these variables once you start doing this you're going to figure out your own short short names for everything i just want it to be real clear what we're talking about here do you mind going back to the symbols one more time there we go thanks just about yeah, I don't know. Hey, gary between the on the wire um length equals the velocity factor and then you've got a number is there some symbol between yeah, velocity that's, factor and the number yeah that's an asterisk it is an asterisk okay for, mul for multiplication and let's go ahead and save our work yeah. so if everything blows up we can come back I usually just hit control S, but you're welcome to click on the little disc icon. I just can't believe it's gonna calculate all these elements when we use the actual words, wavelength over four, wavelength over two, wavelength over four. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So as long as you type it exactly like that, because I know you had a minus sign in one of your words wavelengths. So. Right here for x1, it's minus wavelength divided by four. So that one has to be minus. Yeah. Well, because that because that defines the geometry. It's telling you where to put the end. So uh, I I just have a a comment and. Uh, hi Gary. Uh, hi everybody. Um, I noticed you included the velocity factor, which is a good idea, but then you also included the load, which is causing the velocity f factor. So, right, right. Uh, you know, it seems like you got that in there twice in some sense. Well, what happens is when you add the wire coat and the conductor, it actually shortens the wire. Yes, and then, then you need to shorten the geometry to match. Yeah, but I guess what I'm saying is that if you use a velocity factor of unity, and you have the wire in there, you should find that the wire is indeed shorter. Yeah, the wire does take care of Where you fact, have to optimize. Right. I, and in fact, Gary, just uh, uh, NX, the, the <laughs> antenna that I'm building right now, yeah. when I went to um, a PVC PVC jacket of 0. 0.002 inches uh -huh. or 0. 0.002 feet, uh -huh. my <laughs> antenna went from um, 
I, I, I basically could scale the whole thing down by about 5%. Yeah, that's usually what it ends up being. Yeah. 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 At any rate, which, that was which just... is actually very helpful. Yeah, I, I, uh, I know what you're talking about, Gary. And uh, <laughs> this is the way I do it. Yeah, I, 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 if, if I want to have a fudge factor that calculates things, I usually just label it as a fudge factor. Right. Um, knowing that that it means nothing other than it's an optimization right. constant. Well, anyway, that's my two cents. I'll just right. get back, sit right. back here and watch it. I, I feel like this defines the velocity factor, as you say. And I just, I, in a way, I'm saying this is what's required in order to match, in order to shorten the wire enough so it, it works with that insulation on it. That's the way I look at it. Uh, how are, how's everybody doing? Are we okay to move on? Just a quick side note. I know when I've, I've worked with uh, Fortran and structural engineering, it's very, very specific on... Uh-oh, you disappeared. Sorry, Aaron, you... The words in just typing the words in uh, wavelength over two and wavelength over four. I mean, if you spell wavelength wrong, yeah, it'll mess it up. Yeah, you'll get a report when we try to run it if there's an error, if it can't find a variable because you misspelled something. So, yes. what we're using is exact formats, except for symbols and equations. I assume those are more like notes. Am I wrong? Well, these are just, symbols, it, it, they, they just have to be spelled the exact same way everywhere. Yeah, well, you, don't, you don't have to have a comma between or, a, it's, you know. It's just a variable thing. name. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Yeah, I guess it'll become more apparent as they use it. Anyway. Yeah, so for NEC2, what, it, what it's all about is making it easier to use NEC2. To, NEC to. That's what it's all about. And one of the things that for NEC2 does is it allows you to define these variables. So we're gonna, we've got our, our variables. There was a lot of, you see there's a lot of stuff here just to calculate the wavelength. And there's a lot of stuff to calculate the, uh, the wire coat. And now we've parameterized the lengths of our wires. And there's a whole bunch of different ways to do all of this. We've defined our source and its location. We put on some insulation. We define our ground. And this right here, instead of 14.1, we can actually plug in frequency. Um, so we're going to go ahead and save this. This, uh, I got a bit lost there on the last step. Let's see. Frequency ground. I changed this to the word frequency here. It was 14.1. I just typed in frequency. Okay, now I'm on the right screen. We save our work. We do this again now. Before, before we added the wire code, it was saying that our wire was too short. Now that we've... Um, out of the wire coat, the waves are impeded by that. And so the wire has to be shorter. And now it's probably gonna complain that our wire is too long because I've only gone 0.98 on my velocity factor. Yeah, just remember everybody that, uh, oh, there you go, the wire's too long. Yeah, so <laughs> when you, whether it's water or vinyl or even copper versus magic conductor material. Yeah, bare copper it slows is only bare down. until it gets wet. <laughs> yeah. So here, we're still missing our 14.1 here, but now we can shorten, shorten the wire up. And the uh, easiest way to figure out how much to try is you can see right now it's resonant at 13.5. We want 14.1, so I'm gonna go 13.5 divided by 14.1, it's 0.957.
And so I go back to my editor and I have to multiply that, multiply that times 0 0.98. And in Where's theory, the... in theory, Sorry. yeah, go ahead. I went to, cal we had to calculate, right? In order to get that updated image up, correct? Yep. Yes, we did. Oh. I'm missing, mine says something about velocity factor missing or duplicated or something. Okay, so check the spelling wherever you use some that word. Source load or some of No, I, it's only in the symbol chart. It's not used anywhere else. I think so. Velocity, Velo fact, velocity factor is only used in the symbols chart. Wavelength equals velocity factor, no space. No. There should be no space in the name. Velocity factor, I got no spaces at all. Wavelength equals velocity factor times 299 point and then slash frequency. And that, right. I didn't spell it wrong, so I don't know. But, but on, the, on the line above it, does it define velocity factor? Maybe it's not defined. Yeah, you have to define it somewhere. In fact, it has to be defined before it's used. Okay, well, that's what I, I defined it after I used it. So oh, yeah. I need to move three up to position two. And is there any way of doing that? Well, you can copy, whichever one is longer, copy, copy that this. one to another. Like like you can um, right click on this number three after you select it and go copy row. And you can paste it down here. Paste it down in number six down below somewhere? Sure. And then what? And then put to the velocity factor where wavelength used to be defined. Just so as long can, as I can just delete the other uh, wavelength velocity factor. Well, don't don't read don't delete the line because you need that line to define velocity factor. Well, I already copied it down below. Okay. So can I de delete sure. the original one? Yeah. Okay. So Gary, are you saying that the 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 um, sequence of these symbols makes a difference? Yes. Yes. Oh. It's very simplistic that way. It's yeah. not like computer programming where. Well, actually, it is because if you have a, a variable that you haven't defined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll choke on it. Yeah, some languages will let you define in any order; others won't. Some of them link after they read all the variable names. So, okay. So we got uh, thirteen point five. Does that sound right? Where the SWR bottoms out. So you. Yeah. So I'm running okay. this. Yeah. yeah. When you ran thirteen, it. thirteen and fifteen point three five. Step point one. And wow, look at that. Now, how did I do that? What I did is I divided where it was by where I want it. And uh, it told me exactly the factor to apply. And optimize or something? Or... Haven't done that yet. Well, I'm just not where he's at. Garrett, so, well, Garrett, OK, so he got. On... He got that it was at 13, it was resonant at 13.5 and he wanted 14.1. So he just divided one by the other. Oh, so how do I make the program do that? You do that. You have to, I used a calculator. Yeah. Where did you put that result? I changed. The velocity factor. I changed right? the velocity factor right here. Oh, got it, got it, got it. 0.9383. okay. Good to know. But like anything, there are different ways to do it. Yeah. This is. <clears throat> now, so what it's saying here, there's a couple of things that I wouldn't be real happy about on this antenna. Um, you see this voltage over here, or I'm sorry, the impedance 68.7. I happen to know that that's not, it may not be optimal, but you see this window here, pattern? 
if you select that one and hit the right arrow, it'll change the frequency here. And if you go up to 14.1, you'll see the pattern for that. And what I like to do though, is once I've got it tuned, I, the process we just went through was a tuning process so that it's resonant on our desired frequency. After I do that, then I'll click on the calculate and I'll do far field and it'll calculate the far field pattern just for this one frequency. And now you see we're at 14.1 here and um, I can go show both horizontal and vertical and there's our our typical uh, half wave dipole at a half wave height pattern. Um, I can go over here and do the currents again. And, um, but what's a lot more fun is I can go over here to window, choose 3D viewer. And then I can change this from structure to currents. Here's our familiar dipole current pattern. I can change magnitude to both. That's not important here because basically it's all linear. And I can change from hide pattern to multicolor. And that gives us our familiar um, um, dipole at a half wave height pattern. Now- Magnitude, um, you changed to magnitude to phase or phase or magnitude? No, I'm just, I'm displaying, yeah. So I changed this down here from magnitude, actually. First you have to change this to currents yeah. oh, and yes. then, then you set that to both and it'll, I'll show you another antenna in a little while where phase can be important. Uh, this is all just one line, so it doesn't matter. Now I'm gonna show you on this pattern window, I'm gonna show you how to figure out what's your, uh, in this elevation profile, the blue one. If I, I guess I better turn off that first. Okay, so you see this purple, this uh, magenta line here? It's telling me what my gain is at different right angles above ground. Oh. You see, it's pretty impressive at 60 degrees, almost 7 dB gain, but there's not very many listeners at 60 degrees above ground, <laughs> um, usually. I suppose you could aim it at the ISS. But if you're gonna do DX, generally you're gonna be under 75 and this gain down here is where you're really interested. Notice also the, uh, the, in the vertical pattern, we basically have nulls out the sides and we have um, all of our energy is going out front and back. So um, can everybody see all this? it but i can't make my computer do it um you can see this pad the color beautiful colored multicolored pattern here <laughs> yeah if your computer is really old and doesn't support direct 3d this probably won't work for you question gary yeah so this is a, a question that scott and i were um sort of teasing trying to tease out a couple weeks ago if you were to put this antenna about 10 feet off of a steel roof um and, and i tried to play around with some of the you know the conductivity you know surfaces you know salt water and all that sort of thing to try and see which one would come closest to steel underneath as, as kind of a ground um is there a is is there a good way to to try and here's something you can play with yeah. turn on use second ground here 
and you play with this. Okay. Um, I don't see a selection for steel roof. It's not steel now. So I, I looked at the, uh, I don't know, the, the dielectric there's, constant and, and conductivity, water. and that seemed to be the highest for salt water. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering whether, whether steel, a steel roof would be similar, more similar to salt water or. Right. Um, Try that. that. That will probably at least show you the trend, if not. And then I don't know what these things do. And you can define the distance and the depth. And anyway, that's, that's where you want to go, I think. Okay. Okay and um, see where you get with that. Now where it has the two choices, seawater 10 degrees. Oh, that's that's talking temperature, Never mind. Yeah. Like an angle that, that, yeah, that has to do with if you're on a hill near the ocean. Yeah, yeah. You're coming down onto it. Is that what the second ground does? Second ground is for, for things like what Mario's talking about. Right, but where does it actually put it? I mean, if you think about a second ground, right? That's a that's a uh, an exercise for after <laughs> Ad, the class, advanced class. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's actually if when you figure that out, tell us. Oh well, I just created a second ground, which is I made it salt water, and my uh, my antenna went from fifteen percent efficient to fifty six percent efficient. <laughs> that's a lot better. With a very very low radiation angle. <laughs> Great. So, well, in the next class, you can explain that to us, Scott. <laughs> yeah, my 3D viewer isn't even the same as yours. It says structure, multicolor, total gain. It doesn't have that. It says ARR style. And yours doesn't have that. Your screen did not have that. Yeah. Different so, viewer. Different um, viewer. I don't know why. Now, you before had both up there. I know. I must have clicked on something here. That's maybe why I wasn't able to view the same as you. Just got... I'm going to close it and come back and see what. Nice hot air balloon. Structure. Yeah, I, I uh, clicked on something. Well, try running it again. Try running your. your uh... Yeah. Ooh, what did you do? No, it's here now. It's there now. Okay, good. So I'm not sure what I clicked on. Another thing you can do in here, if you have a complicated antenna, is you can change this. Um, you can turn on this true radius. And if I zoom in here, which I do by dragging up with my middle mouse button, um, it's trying to represent the true radius of the wire here. And if that's a little too small, you can tweak it a little bit. Just move this around. Um, if you're trying to figure out the structure itself, that's something you can do. If, if for instance, you're not sure you got all your wires connected, right? So is everybody having fun? Don't everybody go at once. Really good. It's, uh, it's working for me some, which it wasn't before, so thanks. <laughs> Useful information, Gary. Thank yeah. You. So this is about the simplest antenna you can define. And um, Scott, do you want to show us your antenna real quick? Yeah. And then maybe Gary Rondeau can show us something, and then I'll show you something. Can you show us the optimizer at some point? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Gary Rondeau can show you that. So I'm, I'm going to stop sharing here. Okay. And uh, Scott. Well, let me bring that up. Scott, yeah, Scott show, show us how you do the ang angling of a wire. Like that? Yeah, yeah. All right. So basically, if we look right here, and I'm still... I'm not an expert at this, I will say. Notice for my, uh, I have a single ground, which is a real ground. 
my source and load. I have perfect, uh, perfect conductor, which it's not. It's actually copper. This knocks it down a little bit. And interestingly, the thickness of the insulation that you use changes how long everything is. And uh, that hey, is... Hey, Scott. Yeah. That um, insulation you've got defined there, it should be defined in, as... Okay, so you got like a two... You have a one millimeter radius wire and you're adding a millimeter of... Uh, I, actually have this, I actually have this in feet right here. If I go back to symbols, notice the scaling is in feet. Right. So it's actually to like 20 thousandths. Okay. I get so it. it okay. It's approximate. Right. But you uh, just I'm, make sure you're adding the thickness of your insulation to the wire radius because that's how it works. Okay. Um, what I don't know is whether or not I have correctly defined my wire diameter. You have not. So where does that go here? It goes in Y in the geometry. Oh, wait, I think I do. I think. Oh, I, I do have wire radius. There okay. And wire radius is number 18, which is correct. Except that that's in meters. Okay. I, as far as I know, number 18 will not convert to feet automatically. Oh. Oh, no. <laughs> <sighs> Fun times. That's why you stick to meters. Yeah, I guess. Well. I was trying to trying to expand my horizons a little bit. Hope I didn't shoot myself in the foot and put up something that won't work. It's only going to be off by a factor of three, so it may not. <laughs> Great. So um, okay, there's... so go ahead. Yeah. All right. So if we take a look at the input file, you will see that in my symbols, I have all of these different things. So there's half which i'm naturally not using i don't even know why it's still there um, that's that's from our last class from last class yeah <laughs> frequency 1.85 height of 10. um you're not using that either i'm not using that either so i can actually delete that and i can get rid of half and okay so here's my length this is the the length of my main radiator right here from the bottom to the top. And notice this thing that says feed equals two. Uh, that means I'm feeding it at the second segment. So we'll go to the source and load. Segment is listed as feed. Um, then I have insole, which is 0 0.002, which I can actually come down here and I could actually replace this with INSUL like that. And that would basically just replace it with a new a uh, an alphanumeric or al alphabetic variable, alphanumeric variable like that. Then I also have top cap hat, bottom cap hat one and bottom cap hat two. So now Let's look at the geometry here, and I'll make this bigger. Okay, so we we have our we have our three dimensional space x y z right. So everything starts at zero zero, except that the elements, if you look at them, they start at different heights. Some of them start five feet above the ground. Some of them start at five feet plus whatever that value for length is, which was the length of my radiator. And the main radiator I have defined as element number one. And this basically goes from zero, zero on the x-plane to from five feet up to five plus length. So that gives me my, my vertical geometry. That's my vertical radiator. And notice that it's tag number one, source load. Uh, the source is a voltage source at tag on wire number one right here. And it's located at the feed point, and it's a real with magnitude one. So that defines where that is. So if we look right here, you'll see that all the way at the bottom, notice a little pink dot. That's my feed point. So essentially, it's pretty close to the bottom of the antenna. We're looking at it from the sky now. So as far as these other ones, let's look at the ones that are 
parallel to the ground. So this is my radial one and or the um, bottom cap, bottom cap hat one and bottom cap hat two. So let's go back to my symbols and you see that I have a length on each of them at like 51 feet. So if we go to the geometry, you'll see, okay, well, wire number 20 and wire number 21, that uses the value of bottom capacity hat one. And then because I want it at a 45 degree angle, mm -hmm. let me turn it again like that. Okay, so notice there's my X and Y axes right there, and they're both at a 45 degree angle. And from every everybody back from uh, from uh, trigonometry, 45 degree angle is divided by square root of two or times 0 0.707. So whatever my length is of bottom capacity hat, I divided it by 1.414, which is the square root of two. I could also multiply that by 0.707. Mm -hmm. And I did that in X and Y. So I started here at 0, 0, and I went to this position defined by square root of 2, square root of 2, because it's a 45-degree angle. The same thing on this one, except notice that there's the minus sign out front. That basically takes it in the opposite direction in the X-axis. So that gives me the right length, and it gives me the right angles. And up at the top, notice I held the Y-axis constant, I, it starts at zero and ends at zero. And I'd start at a height of five plus the length. And I scoot over top capacity hat divided by two. And then I scoot down. I start at the height of five plus whatever the length is. That's the definition of the top. Mm -hmm. And then minus top capacity hat times 0.866. So you might recognize 0.866 is square root of three over two, which is uh, which is the uh, cosine of 30 degrees or the sine of 60. And that's how I defined a 60 degree angle. So those are mm -hmm. both bent down at a 60 degree angle. Right. So you have to know some geometry, you have to know some trig, but once you've done that, what's cool about it is I could go in here and I could say, okay, well, I'm gonna change my bottom capacity hat to 40 for both of them, maybe they're not going to be the same. And what this will do when I save it is notice that they're now shorter. Mm -hmm. and, oh, Scott. Just yes. Sorry. Quickly, you just define this as a vertical dipole or not? Or with radials uh, vertical? It, like, it's, it? a, it's a capacitively loaded. It's a, it's a loaded vertical dipole for 160 meters. So the it's really yeah it's kind of a, it's actually a vertical. It, so those are traps then is that what you're saying? No. So we say it's loaded ver with capacitors. Gar Gary Rondo, what would you call this thing other than a monstrosity and a kind of a, an abort and and a, something that you'd probably yeah. never want to actually make? But I'm building. A it anyway. Actually, if you look at at what they sell uh, at DX Engineering for their uh, uh, 160 meter vertical, the top of it looks very similar to what you've got. Does it really? Yeah. And uh, uh, they usually put it on a radial field, yeah, and yeah. just run it as a uh, you know a ground plane that's antenna. Less, but um, but you know, hey, there's different. You know, this is a this is a reasonable approach. So, and yeah, you, what and, what you're trying to do is drive the current in the middle, and there's not much current up up the ends of the wires. Yes. They just end up uh, mostly being electrostatic. So here, let me go back to here, and I'm going to change my. I'm going to put my uh, my bottom radiator elements, I guess you'd call them, back at 51 feet. And let me save this. They should get a little bit longer now. And now I'm going to run this thing. Gary, do you mind if I run it? Oh. Okay. Here we go. Well, so, while that's running, uh, one place that uh, you guys might find useful is in that geometry window. The other one, not the fancy one, but the regular window. Uh, there's a show uh, right menu, here. and you can. Oh, that's very nice. Isn't that nice? Let, let me let me go back and grab it. Show window geometry. Uh, yeah, the other geometry one. There show. 
look for show and symbols is what I was gonna ask. Show, uh, let's see, is it show? Maybe it's view, try view. View symbol conversions. And you can find out like what they're really putting in, uh, like the wire radius there, number 18. Did you write in that number? I wrote number 18. Yeah, but it's telling you what it's actually using. What it's actually doing, yeah. Interesting. So you can find out whether or not that's right or not if it's in feet, uh -huh. for instance. It's probably wrong. In other words, my antenna's, in other words, my antenna's not gonna work. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> I spent all this time putting the damn thing up and now it's not going to work. Can you, can, would you be able to um, convert all this stuff to um, VHF at all? Or is this? Oh, yeah, it's all scale. And the thing is, all, every, everything's scalable. I mean, you an know, antenna is an antenna is an antenna. That's right, which is why they're so cool. You just change the wavelength and it changes the lights. So the other cool thing about this, now that I have the viewer here, is I guess I got to run it again. So let's run this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so there's my currents. All right, so and let's see, Gary, how do you how do you get the the filled currents again? Go uh, you go to uh, at the no, not that Under, one. underneath no. that underneath that you go to where it says the magnitude. Where it says magnitude underneath there. No, 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 no down farther. Oh, there it is. Change that to both. There we go. Okay. So you can see that actually the vertical segment of the antenna is actually carrying quite a large current, which is good because that's what, you know, shoots off a vertically polarized <laughs> signal, hopefully. Is that, is, that, uh, is that directional? Is that what that ladder to the side means? No, they're only, they're only useful relative. relative to each yeah. other because remember, there's a wave going through here and the wave is oscillating. This is just a snapshot of the wave at one point. So, but the other cool thing about this is that now I can also look at this, which is my antenna pattern. Okay. Okay. Notice I have a false color image. I have very little going up to the sky. It's a pretty, it's actually a pretty low angle of radiation. So uh, my hope is that this is my 160 meter antenna. Hmm. That's interesting. I was expected to be asymmetrical because of the angle on those bottom it, elements. It is a. It is actually asymmetrical. Yeah, not a whole lot, but enough. It's some. It's enough. It's an extra. It's an extra dB or two. Hmm. Is is that a, a feature that you're shooting for there? It, it actually is. I mean, it also okay. represents the geometry of my of my lot. Okay. But, yeah. But. Okay. What I what I do get out of it is the fact that okay, so these top elements. Let me get rid of those, and let me get rid of this. Hide pattern. I made the antenna disappear. There we go. The top elements essentially serve to provide some. I don't know. Basically, place for voltages and currents to exist, and they. Uh, uh, if I had a choice, I would lay them flat across the top. But I don't. I have a hundred and something foot tree. Hmm. And I, no, I was just curious so, <laughs> why the bottom elements weren't in the same plane and why they um, go off to the side. I have no room for it. Oh, well, that's a and great also, reason. <laughs> and also, I live on the West Coast and I want to aim more toward the East Coast. Yeah, okay. But one of the things that I found was that if I were to take these and reverse them by doing this, right, just turning the antenna around, the pattern switches. Hmm. If I made them perpendicular, if I made them you know, in the same plane, perpendicular to each other, so that the whole antenna was in one one single plane, I would get something symmetric or very close to it. But that's one of those things that, you know, you can kind of guess what will happen, but you won't really see until you actually try it like this. So how tall is it, Scott? Um, that top, that, that the peak is uh, 85 feet up. So you're about a couple meters off the ground or six feet? Yeah, or the feed point's about six feet above the ground. Yeah. Cool. And um, so it now... It looks like it'd be pretty low cost, really. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, how many times have I fallen in my yard because it's on a hill and it's all muddy? And what? Why are antennas okay. tend to be low cost? Yeah, that's okay. So now actually I'm going to do this thing called the optimizer right now. 
and see this thing that's called optimizer. Notice we have weighting factors. And and where did, where did you get to that from? Let me close that again. So you, when you go to calculate. Oh, under calculate, okay. Under calculate, you have uh, L, pi, and T matching. We're not going to use that, but we're going to do this optimizer. And All right. if you haven't created variables, you won't be able to do the optimizer, which is why the optimizer, which is why the variables are such a good thing. So for instance, I could say, all right, my weighting factors, we have gain front to back ratio. We have, I'm not sure what F, FR would be. Front um, to rear. Front to rear. How's that different from front to back? Huh. Uh, one of them is at a particular angle and the other was oh. sort of integrated over the whole area. Okay. Um, resistance and uh, that'd be reactance and efficiency and SWR. Well, I'm actually looking for the best SWR for something and what I want to do is I'll say let's let's modify my length and have it optimize the length, in other words, how, how big that vertical radiator is to optimize at a given frequency with 100% impact for on SWR and say go. So now what you'll see is it's basically messing around with the height of the radiating element and seeing what happens to the SWR. SWR is shown on the left side there. Yep. So here's my SWR, and it's going through iterations and said, okay, well, your best SWR is 1.07, and it occurred at a, at a length of 80.4 feet. Now it says right here, see this thing in the, in the center that says update NEC file? If you want to accept the changes that it found and say update the file, it will actually store those values for you back in your edited file. And if you don't want to, or you want to start again, let's say I don't want to do that. I want to actually work on the, the bottom hats and say resume, we're going to start with a different target. So now it's messing with the, the bottom capacity hat lengths to see where, what happens to the SWR. So basically what's cool about this is that if you have everything in variables, it allows you to let the program go and figure out what, you know, what values mathematically give you the best result based on, you know, based on what you've decided are important factors to optimize on. Very cool. Very, very cool software. Uh, hey, Scott, have you tried the sweep function? Um, is that under optimizer or? Yes, under optimizer. I don't know. So if you go to up in the left there where function, try yeah. sweep. Oh, there we go. Okay, and now um, pick something like, how about the feed point? Okay. On the, just that feed point number, I'm curious. And uh, just say, uh, vary it from, uh, I'll, go from. I'll do it on the whole range. Okay. Uh, oh. No, it doesn't so matter. these, uh, there's this gain in front to back here. You have to set that up. Yeah. All right. Well, I've never tried it, so I'll mess with that. Anyway, you have to mess with it. But I, I like the sweep because it, it helps you understand how a particular uh, variable actually uh, affects things. And you can, uh, a lot of times, it's just, there's just too many things going on. And it's much better just to use your own yeah. brain so move once you have an idea. Move off of works. sweep. Move off yeah. of sweep. Yeah. The, 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 the software is actually incredibly powerful. There are many tools which even the novice user like myself have never seen. <laughs> and you might find by accident. So, hey, yeah. Scott, could those ground planes be actually put in the ground? Like, are they ground? Uh, you can the actually ground them, yes. Yeah. But they, I think the software I read somewhere says you have to have them at least a couple inches off the ground for it to run. It, it depends. I mean, you can actually, there, there's an, uh, this, this says where wire ends touch ground, current will be in infinite ground. That just means if, you, if a wire goes to the ground, it, it'll be in it, a ground post. Right. So there's, you know, and, and depending on how you've selected your ground, whether it's perfect or whether it's, you know, imperfect or salt water or dirt that changes how, I mean, this is, so 
let's let's just say that if we think about how antennas are modeled, right? So let's go through and calculate just really quick. I actually I actually did antennas in 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 uh, graduate school. That was one of the things that I really liked and took a class in. So if we take a look at this antenna and look at this pattern and look at this multicolor image. Okay, so what this thing is really doing is, when, remember when we selected a number of segments for each wire? Well, what you end up doing is saying, okay, let's take a look at the currents and we're going to hide the pattern. What we're going to do is segment this whole thing out. Right? There are all the different antenna segments. And so we've got segments, and each one is carrying a current. What this software is doing is saying, okay, for each of those segments, for at any point in space, what effect is the current in that segment having on the radiated energy in that area? And then it goes to the next segment, and then it does the same thing, and then the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And it figures out what the total is by looking at, you know, w whether they're in phase or out of phase with each other. And it goes through a point on a sphere. Then it says, okay, we're going to go to another point on a sphere. And then another point and another point. And by the time everything is done, you have something that looks like this, which is basically the magnitude of the radiated field at every point in space at a distance. In a, in a sphere surrounding this antenna. Does which Scott is, love this? Which is why this software is so <laughs> incredibly cool. Because I have gone through the process of having to, you know, in, in graduate school, in, uh, we had to say, okay, take a piece of wire and break it into three segments and approximate what the pattern would look like. And you had to try to, like, do it by hand. Um, and it took a very long time. The other one we did was when I was in uh, undergraduate in taking an antennas class, we had to take a uh, just a dipole antenna and use um, MathLab or MathCAD. I can't remember which one it was. MathLab. And we had to create the formulas for figuring out what the piecewise approximation would be for three-dimensional space, you know, what the antenna pattern would look like. And this was on a an old 8086 processor, maybe an 8088, maybe a 286 or something. Anyway, just for a dipole antenna, for a very rudimentary thing, it took a day and a half. It was a day and a half to figure out what a dipole looked like. So this is an amazing tool. All right. Hey, Gary, Gary's turn. Yep. That's it for me. <laughs> I don't really have my, I'm not uh, actually at my real computer. I'm out at the beach. <laughs> well, I, I can show you some more stuff. Well, I don't have much to share. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Scott. So um, I'm going to take it back and I'll show you some more stuff. Oliver, there's you. Okay. So, um, there is in in here a run menu, and there's something called its HF. And if you want to get complicated, this is how you can do it. You can uh, define where your transmitter is and where your transmit and receive antenna are, and it will. There's a contour map and it will show on the earth where your, um, where your propagation is gonna go. That's just something I just wanted to expose you to. That, that has to be installed separately. It's called, um, it, it, was used, it was developed by Voice of America when they were figuring out where they should put antennas to, um, to spread their information. Well, that's an absolutely useful tool. Uh, where do you find that? So it's called its HF. And um, it 
uh, when you go to the um, Cornec 2 website, it'll tell you there how to install that. I haven't tried it yet. I just wanted to show you that. Cornet um, 2? The, no, this, this, uh, just a minute, let me. At the same place I downloaded the modeling software from, they also had a link to this. Yeah. Yeah. So here at this site, they hit, they have this link here. Or it's HF, Voice of America Coverage Analysis Program. You can integrate that with Fornac too, and it can generate plots showing where on earth your propagation would go. And that's kind of amazing. That's all free. Will that actually uh, estimate your your expected propagation on, based on your antenna and gain and everything, your location and everything? Yes, based on everything. It, all that information is passed from Fornec to to Vocap, and then it's and then Vocap will map it and show you who's going to be able to hear you. And that's kind of amazing. Well, let's um, let's just say that a lot of money has been spent on figuring out how to get signals into a particular part of the world and we are we are reaping the benefits of that incredible expenditure that it that was made right another link on this page is um well there's this canoe plot thing that integrates and in case you want to pre create charts from your variables that works really well um but there's also, let's see here. Um, hmm. Okay, I'll just show you the file because I'm not finding it. It's, um, this is called the NEC2 manual. And just a minute, I'll oh, stop flashing. So this is a free download from nec2.org. And um, this is the user's guide. This is for the underlying software. This is not for Fornac 2. But what it does is it defines these cards. Um, it shows you what kind of variables you can plug into the different parameters and how they, how they affect each other. Um, so that's that, that there's also a link to that on the Coronet 2 webpage. And then this site is really interesting because it describes a lot of the shortcomings of these kind of modeling programs and how to work around them. For instance, here's a link re reading an NEC2 deck that'll define, it shows you what, um, what the NEC program actually works with. Um, there's all kinds of information here. And this is at a site called ant, a -N -T -N, a -N -T -E -N -T -O -P org, And this shows you that. Um, oh, yeah, that actually has a lot of articles by LBC Vic. Right. It's a good site. It talks about phasing wires and um, which you can also define in Fornac too. You can define phased. Uh, in fact, I'll show you a phased antenna right now. So that was uh, n org. Yeah. So I'll show you what I've been playing around with for quite a while. <laughs> oh, this one. Okay, so this is a little modification, but let me, let me get a different one. So here. As we know with any program, it's garbage in, garbage out. So it's nice to know where it's uh, how it's working, right? Right. So um, this this uh, file is actually normally edited in my text editor instead of this is how I normally work. Instead of using the editor inside Fornec two, I um, 
I use a text editor and I comment out stuff that I'm not currently working on so I can refer back to it later if I want. But I'll show you this, show you what this thing looks like. Okay, so we'll do a frequency sweep. And this is gonna be 21, we'll go 20 to 20. It's going to take a while, so I'll, I'll just do. There's a lot of wires in this. It's 26. Well, you can see the progress meter down here. It's doing a lot of stuff. One of the things that this model has is it has some close parallel wires. I'm actually basically modeling um, trans, trans lines because, well, you'll see why in a sec. So this, here's my pattern. Here's my geometry. Um, I'll, zoom in on, I'll zoom in on this one because it's easier to see true radius and make it a little bit bigger. And um, this is a transmission line, it's not an antenna. Okay, so this blue thing here is a true trans, a, a perfect transmission line that you can define inside Fornac 2. Um, I use that only for phasing, for phasing the source. But um, what the structure here is what I wanted to show you right now. Okay, so what this is is a J-pole type match here at the bottom, and I'm feeding it above above the shunt at the bottom, and then there's a uh, there's a um, a delay line here between two half wave radiators. So this is stacked half wave radiators on 15 meters, and um, I, I didn't want to take forever, so I didn't, there's not much resolution to this guy, but I'll, I'll go ahead and do the um, par field pattern and I'll show you what that looks like. <clears throat> Here, this is an example of a model where phasing is important. Oh, calculating or something? Okay, so this looks about the same here until I do this, until I show currents. And then I'll phase the currents. And this is, this is the current pattern for this antenna. And I've built uh, at least three, at least two of these guys, different wavelengths. And um, so what down here at the bottom, the power comes in and um, the coax is connected to the two sides of the J-pole match at the bottom. This is basically a quarter wave um, transformer here. Although there's also, there's also a stub at the bottom which provides impedance matching. And a ballon or we said a stub, yeah. It's a stub, although it's not, it's not shorted until you get down in into the uh, the mat down here. Anyway, it's like a J-pole, but I've discovered that J-poles are a little more complicated than what you normally read about. So the signal comes to here. This is a true half-wave radiator here. And then the signal goes up right here. This is just a delay line. It goes out a quarter wave and comes back. And then it goes up to another half-wave radiator and this these the important thing here is that this radiator and this radiator are in phase and if if this was just a straight wire they wouldn't be in phase well these these two parts would still be in phase but there'd also be a counter phase 
coming out the other side here and it would be it would basically be deleting the effect of one of these two radiators by sending it out this delay line and coming back i'm able to phase these two properly now an interesting thing about this antenna is that i can also it also works on 17 meters so um, if i calculate the same thing for 18.1 megahertz. And I'll show you the pattern that generates. If you look down here in the lower left corner, you'll see the propagation pattern. It's got quite a bit of gain at low pre at low angles. So, um, okay, so this, uh, this looks just the same. You see this propagation pattern looks different, but I still have five dBs at lower than 10 degree angle, which is kind of amazing. And that, keep in mind, this is a full circle. If I show the top, you'll see it's, it's roughly a full circle. Um, there is some front to back front and back gain. But um, if I now show the currents here and phase them, uh, this looks very different. However, there is a majority of signal coming off the one side and that makes it almost as effective as the 15 meter. Uh, it, it, it's just, this isn't behaving as a normal uh, J-Pole match anymore. There's something else going on, but it's very effective. Um, so funny things can happen when you start modeling antennas. And, and when you find something like this, you just, you just put a smile on your face and go ahead and build the damn thing and see what happens. Um, you see the impedance here isn't, doesn't look so hot. SWR isn't so great. At, but in reality, this thing actually performs very well. So um, I'm trying to think if there's something else to show you. I guess we'll just open up for questions now. Anybody have any questions? I can only imagine how many questions. <laughs> I was wondering if Scott would be willing to share his file of his model he's been building it, because I think it'll work in my lot, <laughs> and I could play with it. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking the same thing. I mean, I I haven't successfully built it yet, but I'd be happy oh. to share it. <laughs> well, there's no liability here. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so it's just a small text file, right? NEC file, right? Yeah. Well, if you'd be kind enough. Yeah, I can do that. And then you got your... Uh, I can message you 24-7 regarding it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, that'd be, a, that'd be a nice little basis, right? Well, is there I'm, any uh, is there any planned meetings going forward that we can uh, sort of catch up with one another here? Or? Well, that was uh, Gary. That was something that you were talking about, right? Um, I guess when you were talking with when we were discussing doing this, we were sort yeah. of discussing with Mario whether or not if there was a desire to do a second, like you know, more advanced. Yeah, we could come back together in a week next, uh, next Saturday, same time, and we could see what people are up to and answer any questions people have. Um, a week, a week may be a little short. Yeah, <clears> it's going to take a little while to whatever. digest. Yeah. <laughs> as long as we can get them all, all built before winter field day. <laughs> Gary, can, can you post uh, like screenshots of the, uh, you know, the dot neck window for symbols geometry source load whatever else you used um and then also just the the neck file so i can see the relationship between the the raw text file and then what it's doing uh in the in the dot neck uh display you want to see this what this is doing so yeah just for the simple dipole oh 
for the simple dipole, just yeah, I'll, I'll open that, that right. Plus the, then the sort of a screenshot, if you will, of the symbols, geometry, source load, frequency, ground. So, um, so I, okay. I can get a, an idea of, of how they translate from one to the other. Right. So, so here's for, here's the NEC file that I created for the workshop today. Okay. Um, and once you create a file like this, I find it easier to just go in and do search and replace and stuff if you want to rename things. And you can insert lines for variables instead of having to copy and paste them later. You can, um, you know, you this is just straight text. And um, so which is the source load line? So there, this LD here is, this is copper. This is permittivity in copper, I think, mm -hmm. or con conductivity. And then this is, um, this is the, the 4.5 here represents soft vinyl. And this is the variable, right, so this is the radius. So having this file and then screenshots of each of those windows, then I can sort of make the connection so, sort of, sort of Robert yeah uh, you might want to take a look at on my website squashpractice.com on the radio page uh, there's a presentation that we that we I gave to the ham club uh, a couple of years ago it's called practical antenna modeling or something like that uh -huh. and uh, it's got um, it's a PDF file and it, it has a lot of nice screenshots and oh, okay you can read right off of it. You know, it'll be sitting there right in front of you and uh, might be helpful. Okay, cool. Is that a um, uh, YouTube channel, Gary? No, it's just, uh, it's my it's my website. My website is squashpractice.com. Just put it in the, I just put it in the chat. Okay, I can do that. No, so I already Robert, I already Robert this, okay. this file that I'm showing you is just the file I created today. I'm just opening it in a different program. Um, in other words, when you go here and open this, and you choose this file. Instead of opening it with Fornac 2, you can just right click on it and choose, choose open with uh, stupid Microsoft. <laughs> anyway, no, I it, have- It just opens with WordPad when I click on mine. Well, yeah, WordPad, not, yeah, whatever. Yeah, so that's all you need to do to see how it's laid out. Just open the file in a different program in an editor. So um, I'll show you one, let's see, one more thing. Oh, let's see. Let's go. Okay, this will. Okay, so this shows the, this is the actual SWR on this antenna, it's SWR 50 and the, the impedance is 50 ohms. <laughs> and this is the voltage you get at the feed point. And um, here, if I, yeah, so at 21.3, it shows um, 4.92 dB gain at eight degrees off, off the horizon, which is pretty good. And um, so I was, you can plot stuff like 
um, SWR plot. This is GNU plot. I was telling you about that. So if you do a sweep like Gary was talking about, you can then plot, um, you can plot various variables on top of each other and see, watch, watch one thing go up. Here's um, gain, here's impedance. Um, Trying to, I, I, I've seen some other things I wanted to show you, but I'm not. You can do log scaling. Um, let, let's see what this does. So here's your, this is your source. This is just details about your, your feed point. Um, Oh, there's also a Smith chart. Um, so this is pretty cool. And you can actually import touchstone files. And you can export this. Uh, so I have to explain something real quick about what that means. Um, this, I don't know if anybody has one of these. This is a vector network analyzer, and I can plug in. Hey, Gary, you want to kill your share so you can take up more of the screen? Uh, sure, yeah. So I'll um, just kill the share. OK, so this is a nano VNA. Nano, nano I'm going to plug an antenna into it. Actually, the one we were just looking at. I don't know. I problem is I won't be able to show you while it's plugged in. Well, I could. What I can do is I can plug in the cable and show you on the screen what it's seeing. Let me do that. What I want to do, what I'm trying to show you is that there's a correspondence between reality and modeling. So I'm going to start. So I'm going to go ahead and share again, I guess. Yeah. OK. So here's, um, actually, let's just do this. Come on, you can do it. Oh, I started two of them, <laughs> I think. OK, so I'm going to load a calibration file. And um, I'm going to connect to device. OK, so it's connected. You weren't I'm, wanting to share, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> OK, sorry. So I'm going to go ahead and sweep this antenna at the same range that we just saw. 20.3 to 22.3, I guess. Oops. OK. And I'll just do two. And um, so we're going to sweep my actual antenna that was based on. And it must be wet out there or something because my SWR is not very good here. How, how long is the uh, feed line out to that? So let me see here. It's uh, this one is about 50 feet. So here's, yeah, so the SWR isn't great right now. It's 1.44. Often it's way down, but um, 
the the frequency is pretty good here. Anyway, there's a correspondence between reality and the model, and um, so if you have something like a vector network analyzer, a nano VNA, you can actually um, optimize it the same way that you would optimize an antenna. For instance, here at this marker, at this red marker, the impedance is 60.3 ohms. Well, the way that you lower the impedance on this antenna is you shorten up that match. You, you just make it shorter. And when you do that, the impedance goes down and then your SWR would, would improve. And um, so basically you do the same things with your real antenna that you do with the model. Once you've gone through that cycle a couple of times, it becomes a very strong imprint on your brain. Like, oh, you know, like try to follow the model. Um, there are some shortcomings, especially related to ground reference and so on. And um, But what the program is really, really good for is if you have an antenna and you can model it, and then you can make some modifications, you can find out what'll happen after you make those modifications. So this is actually a um, diagnostic display as a as an antenna analyzer, is that what this is? Yes, this is the, the analyzer I'm using, it's called a nano VNA. Yeah, 100 bucks. Yeah, under, I paid oh, about- Under 100 bucks. Paid about $80 for this. And so this is, actually, tool. this is actually hooked up to the antenna that I modeled that I was showing you a minute ago. That is cool. Yeah. This analyzer can do time domain reflectrometry, which means if you have a glitch in your coax, it'll tell you how far down the line it is. For instance, if a cat scratched the, the, the house, the covering and water got in there and it's corroding the shield and the conductor and shorting them out, it'll actually show you where that, it'll, it'll show you how far down the line that is. It's a hundred dollar version of a $20,000 instrument. Yeah, really. so that's really what it is. So this is kind of a partner to the uh, to the uh, modeling because uh, once you've modeled it, you can um, you can try things on the model and then actually execute them in reality and see the same kind of changes. So do we? Uh, sounds like next Saturday would be too soon for another class. Maybe February sometime. Let's see. Yeah, I was thinking like a month down the road, give us time to digest and play with this thing. Huh. Wimps. <laughs> hey, is it worth? Uh, Pretty much. Is it worth trying to model a patch antenna or is that beyond the realm of what this will do. There's well. no reason that it shouldn't be able to model pretty much anything that you can model. Okay, so there's modeling and there's analyzing, right? Those yeah. are two separate things. I was looking so, at some website that said that it doesn't really account for the uh, for stuff built on uh, circuit board material very well. Sure, let me show you. So if you go into the editor, um, I have to be careful I mean, not to say this. I mean, so like, a, like a strip line antenna. It might, you know, but yeah. I mean, there's no real reason that it wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to do it. You just would have to be creative in creating your geometry correctly. Yeah. Yeah. I saw like instead of wire, there's a lot of different other yeah, rectangles you, and things you can pick in there. That's right. Yeah. I'm trying to find that. So I'll, I'll read the manual some more. Yeah. Yeah, basically, if there's something you're wondering about, it, it'll do its best. I can't say it'll be 100% accurate, but. Oh, here it is, say, Geometry Builder. Builder. So here, it, in the Run menu, there's something called the Geometry Builder, and it'll let you build patches, hmm. uh, planes, oh, wow. boxes, cylinders. So parabolas. it generates the card sequence to describe that stuff. Yeah. yeah. And if you only need to interface with it in a you know a point or two, then it's um, or helix. Yeah, the the problem you're going to run into with with this stuff is the number of number of points it 
generates. If there's a lot of wire elements in the model, it takes a while. Yeah, it takes a while and it um, it'll even run into a limit. This this current version of Pornec 2 that we normally run is, is limited to 1500 segments. Uh, okay. So Gary, um, did you see the note from Tom there? The difference between NEC2 and not like NEC4, et cetera, et cetera? Right, so NEC4, as far as I know, it it does a little better on with the ground. That That's the main thing that we would notice. And um, if you go, let's see. There is, so NEC4 works with 4NEC2. NEC5 isn't yet developed, but this person is putting out new versions all the time. And so people are expecting him to support NEC5. Uh, did, so didn't he just retire? No, that's easy, no. Nick. Oh, that's the other that's, thing. That's Roy, that's Roy Llewellyn. Oh, uh, okay. That's he easy, was, Nick. Uh, he, was, he was a lifer at Tektronix, I believe, and also went on his own and did uh, all kinds of software. And I, I know him from the QRP community, actually, from long ago. So... Um... Question, uh, Gary. Yeah. So I'm going to want to model my uh, two meter um, uh, dipole with uh, four 45 degree radials at the base, but they're 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 not they're not connected. And so when I'm modeling this thing, I'm assuming that you don't use the same common we, point for all these, right? Right. So in the examples that come with the program, there, there might be a model in there that you can modify. Um, but let's see, so we're going to choose. What, I, what, I, what I'll usually do is, let's say I'll take the driven element and I'll put 101 elements, 101 points in it. And if I'm doing a quarter way vertical, for instance, I'll have the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the vertical element and I will put the... Uh, I will put the source at position number one and then right below that uh you know i'll connect it at the exact same point i'll actually have the rest of, oh there you go gary yeah so I'll, I'll run a i'll run this model right now can you open up the edit file can you open up the file real quick i want to see what the geometry is so you're actually yeah. connecting everything right there at point one right but no. the source breaks no. it i'll show you the source breaks it. Yeah. Right. Oh, I see. But you must be able to define isolated elements like reflectors and stuff, right? Oh, yeah. That's just a wire in space. Yeah, exactly. It's just yeah. not hooked to anything. Why am I having trouble figuring out what frequency to do here? Okay, well, we'll just do this. 144 to 148. Or you could do 130 to 150. Yeah. Oh. And the great thing about so it here's is, um here's yep. a pattern here's Look so this you are though I haven't got it right here I did something wrong um so let's open up the editor If you wouldn't yeah. mind sharing this file, I would I would love to play with this. It's already created. Yeah. Hey Gary, does this yeah. thing does, does this thing do trig as well? Like if you have an angle of 44 degrees, can you put cosine of angle? Does it will it actually calculate that for you? Um you there is yeah, there are cosine functions available. Okay. In the in the editor. So in other words, I so don't have I'm to not... put 0.866. I can put, you know, cosine of 30. Exactly. You can do rotation and all that. Ooh. Okay. So um, I'm not sure why this isn't. So we'll go ahead and zoom in here and look at. So there's true radius and yeah, if we look. Uh, you get too close, it clips it out. But anyway, yeah, there is a gap there. 
Oh, maybe I can show it better on here. Yeah, so there is a segment here. I'll show segments. Oh, by the way, you can tap on the click on a segment here and it shows voltage coming in and voltage going out and all that kind of stuff. That's actual data that it uses to calculate all this stuff. So, so I'm going to show segments. You see that bottom segment there is the source and it separates the vertical element from the others. So that's how you model it. And um, so anytime you put a source like that, it creates a separation in there. Yeah, yeah it's not it's not uh -huh. a real wire. It's uh -huh. just it's just telling Fornec two where to put the source. It, it's like not if you actually take a, like if you take a half wave piece of wire and you put a a source at the center that becomes a center fed dipole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The source splits the two halves. Yeah. So let's look at. It's a digit. It's a different way of thinking about it, but that's essentially what it is. Oh, that's a mess. So, um, yeah, there's something wrong. I, I must have played around with this file. But um, it's not going to be very hard to model. So I'll leave it as an exercise. <laughs> and you know, I will. Oh, there's there's so many exercises in here. Hamster, what you got? Um, I'm actually going to share, not share on that. Just a screen. minute. Ham, Hamster has a question. What's going to be the next meeting about, like, class? Um, uh, because so I was, like, doing ham radio classes. The next ham radio, or the next, are you talking about ham radio class? No, the next one of these. Okay, next antenna class will be on the 12th of February, and it'll be whatever people want to do. And Scott, okay, when, thanks. Scott, when you promote it, you have to say it's not a beginner class. Right. This is the advanced class. <laughs> intermediate, maybe. This is intermediate. This is the, oh, my God, what did I do wrong class? <laughs> yeah. All right. So let me see. I know I've got the file. I just have to find it. I wanted to share that. I know I can put it in the chat. Just give it, bear with me and give me a second, everybody. So while Scott's doing that, uh, Gary, I have a question. All right. Yes, Tom. Hello. Can't hear you. Can't hear you, Tom. You disappeared. Sorry, that was me, I think. Um, so oh, it was Lance. Hi, Lance. Yes, Lance. Under the any under the uh, in the main window settings, you can go down towards the bottom. It has the NEC engine. Is there a reason to choose one of those three? No, because you don't want to pay any money anyway. Does the NEC forty cost money? Four does. Yes, you actually oh. have to license it from Lawrence Livermore Labs. Okay, I may have missed that part of the presentation here. Thank you. Yeah. The one that comes with it is free. If you want to do 4.2 or whatever, NEC4, then you have to license that directly. Nah, I'm cheap. <laughs> I'm cheap when it comes to that. There are other programs out there that will let you model a car and put a quarter wave uh, vertical on top and see how much exposure people in the car get when you're using 100 watts stuff like that but this isn't it <laughs> yeah and okay let's see that looks like i actually put test 30.nec out there so you guys should be able to download that and that is my funky looking antenna and uh just for reference i should really be putting this I think we said uh, the the working files can be anywhere in your computer. It was that ex executable file that I wanted to have on my uh, root drive, right? It it looks like you can't have a space in the path. And they can't have a space in the path. Test thirty. All right. Thanks so much, Scott and everybody. And that's because Fornic two writes a file and sends it to NEC two, 
NEC2 generates some stuff and sends it back. And NEC2 does not know about spaces and file names. It's been around a long time. Basically old DOS kind of file name rules, yeah. I think. Actually, I thought it was mainframe based, wasn't it? Yeah, it's worse. Oh. It's it's card it's IBM card based. <laughs> <laughs> and if you so use a if you use a long name, it'll get cut down to an eight dot three DOS name before so it's, it's before it's sent out. So if it's IBM, so if it's Epsodic, not ASCII. Eh, who knows? It's it was it was written a long it, it was started a long time ago. Yeah, if you it's go to that, a long time. you go to the Fornet uh, or the NEC2.org website, they have, um, there's documentation of how long it'll take to run on different many computers and mainframes and <laughs> stuff. You mean like if you happen to still have a PDP-11? Right. You can how, run how it many, on that? How many minutes or hours it'll take? Yeah. <laughs> uh. Well, I or, sure or, I or enjoyed that, or, this. Or if you still have a deck vax that you're supporting, right? Yeah, well, I really enjoyed this. Thank you all for coming. And thanks uh, for doing this, Gary. Appreciate it. Right. Yeah, thanks a lot. Very a lot. helpful. I really appreciate you being available to do this, Gary. This is awesome. Good. And yeah, we'll we'll Mario, have another another Mario, beginner. Is this what you were looking for? Absolutely. Oh, good. I will tell you that, you know, I, I did quite a bit of um, background sort of um, inter introducing myself to this thing, because without that, this would have been um, a lot harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So going through some previous, um, you know, YouTube videos and that kind of stuff was very helpful because um, this was this was slightly more advanced than absolute basic. Yeah, well, I was. What I want to give you in this class is a false sense of security. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, let me show you guys really quick. I know everybody's got to go, and this will be the very last thing. So I just actually came to the conclusion that, you know what? My wires, like Gary was saying, the dimension of the wires was slightly off. Well, I've already hung stuff in the trees. There's not a lot I can do about lengthening those, but I could conceivably try to optimize things by lengthening my my lower wires. So, okay, let's say that I want to lengthen my lower wires. Can I do that? Well, the answer is I'm going to go to I'm going to go to my setup, and I'm going to just uh, set these to like 60 or 50 feet, like I had them set, and I'm going to say, OK, software, do your best. Now that I figured out that my wire is actually 0 0.0016 feet <laughs> and my insulation is 0 0.0015. Now, okay. wait a minute. Wait a minute. The coach should always be more than the radius, than the wire. Is It's not a thickness? No, it's a radius. It's an, OD, it's an OD, except it's a oh. radius instead of diameter. That's okay, so that actually that, needs to be 0. 0.00. It needs to be plus. 0. Yeah. So the reason for that is that. Uh, I wonder what's going to happen now. Oh, NEC, NEC only looks at the surface. It doesn't go in, It doesn't really know anything about solids. Well, RF doesn't care. Right. Everything's skin, skin effect. Okay. Well, I still have something that works. Okay. At least it works a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is say, okay, optimizer, do your best. I'm going to pick my bottom capacity hats and I'm going to say, okay, get me something that's a match. Here we go. I picked SWR is the most important thing, the only thing. And the, the length of my bottom capacity hat, let's see if it can come up with something. That's okay. the easiest thing for you to change, right? Yep. Because it's on the ground. <laughs> So, okay, so what it means is now that I modified it a little bit, notice what it's doing. It's saying I can get your SWR down to 1.5 ish. And you know what? I'm going to be very happy with that. I can, I can, that's a decent match to a piece of coax. It's 160 meters. There's not a lot of loss. I'm not going to care. 
So I started at 50 feet. Okay, this just basically said that my uh, my bottom radials, whatever they are, try uh, try closer to 60 feet. Okay, right. I'm gonna say I accept it, and so there you go. So if you if you happen to have that file that I put out there, it's uh, it's slightly flawed. I'm still learning how to use this myself. But now when I run it and I say go, let's look at the pattern. It really is quite addictive, especially if you're a, a tinkerer and you want to actually build something. But here's my pattern. I can live with that. And more importantly, here is my frequency sweep. And there it is. Look at that nice dip. Yay. I can live with that. You can transmit 100 watts now. I can put out 100 watts without frying my tuner with that. <laughs> Thank you all. Have a good night. Thanks, guys. You guys rock for coming. Good night. <laughs> good night, everybody. Take care. Gary? Yep. Thanks, Gary. Yep. Take care, Scott. Awesome Thank you. Show. Oh, good. <laughs>